Hey everyone, welcome back to Rose's Year of One. Today's video is going to be quite a long one. You guys will know how long it is before I even do because I'm at the start of filming it and you will have been able to click on it knowing what has been filmed and edited down. So yeah, I would be prepared, get comfy, get a drink. I've been putting off filming this because today we're going to do my February and March haul video. I have my phone because I have a lot of notes. And if you've clicked on this expecting a traditional haul video, then sorry, it is not that. My Year of One is a low buy project that I'm undertaking this year and I am allowed to buy one thing a month. Last year I did a complete no buy year and this is my way of trying to reintroduce shopping and consuming back into my life but controlling it through that quantity control and hopefully never letting it get back to what it was beforehand. So my haul video is it is about what I bought. I will show what those items are for the two months, but it's more about the process of buying them, the sort of emotional process of buying them, the sort of emotional turmoil, sounds very dramatic, but it is that at times, of going from being somebody who was such a, you know, impulsive shopper, who was overly consuming from a bad place, from a place of unhappiness, um, you know, trying to fulfil myself with buying stuff um, to then going on to a no buy, not buying anything for a year and now trying to reintroduce that without it becoming the dangerous sort of addictive habit that it was beforehand where it was my source of dopamine that I kept going back for. My neighbour is doing some work and I don't know if you're going to be able to hear that or not sometimes it sounds really loud to me but the camera doesn't pick it up so I don't, I'm just gonna get through this because it's Saturday and this video needs to go up tomorrow because I work full time as well as doing YouTube so it is what it is and I missed last week so I don't want to miss tomorrow so this is my window to film and if he is drilling in the background then we're just gonna have to get through it. So I've been putting off filming this, this should have gone up well actually I mean my February haul should have gone up in February but it, I've just been having so many sort of thoughts and feelings that I've been putting them off because I thought maybe a little bit of distance between them would let me kind of reflect on it and give you something more worthwhile. Not massively convinced that that's happened but what I know is that I do not want this to become a February, March, April update. So we're going to go through February and March. Let's get into it. <laughs> So if you remember from my January haul video, I bought my shoes right at the start of the month because I knew that I wanted them, I was planning to buy them, which meant that for the majority of January I ended up on a no buy. And the no buy is the continuation of what I did last year, it's when I just don't really engage with shopping or consuming and I definitely find that easier than trying to engage with it in a controlled way. I don't do moderation particularly well in any aspect of my life. I'm somebody who's very much, if I'm doing something, like I'm doing it 110% or I'm not doing it. I find just not dealing with any of it so much simpler than trying to look at things to buy and trying to decide what to buy, but not just giving in to just that becoming everything that I see that I like, just saying, well, that's what I should buy and buying it. January had, for the most part, really after buying the shoes, been a no buy month, which is quite a sort of safe place for me to be. And then I filmed my January haul and I was talking as well in that about the things that I had looked at that month that I didn't buy because I think that's a really important part of what I'm doing this year is trying to understand my processes that I use when making the decisions and what to actually commit to and why certain things don't make it. Um, and I talked in that about wanting a treadmill because I was in a really good place. So I was furloughed last year, which was horrible. Not a good place in terms of like job security, obviously financially not ideal. I didn't know if my company were gonna make it through the pandemic. I didn't know if I was going to have a job sort of every day expecting like an email or a phone call to come through and say, yeah, we're just letting you go kind of thing. So it was not a good time mentally and I have to say I was so glad I was doing a no buy year because like financially if I had not been doing a no buy year last year I would have been in dire straits. Um, so yeah but 
that part being on Farlow side, it can be so much time. Like I'm now back full time and I'm really realising how little time I have, even down to like missing this video last week. I missed this video last week because I work Monday to Friday and I don't get home until quite late and I don't have the energy left at the end of the working day to film this kind of video. And then my friends messaged me on Friday and were like, we're going to go to Loch Lomond tomorrow, do you want to come? And I was like, do you know what, I really do because obviously we've been in lockdown until last week when the sort of travel restrictions were lifted. You could only go in your local council area and you know, the idea of kind of getting out into sort of proper national park, fresh air, just really appealed. So that's what I did with my Saturday last week and that left me, I didn't have time because I had commitments on the Sunday to some writing work that I'm trying to do. If I could have been furloughed without the stress of worrying about whether I was going to have a job or not impacting on me, I would just love to take like three months off because it, it like, I think if I hadn't had the stress that I did, I would have been so much more productive than I was in certain other areas of my life. But to get to the point, because I need to try and make these points brief in this video because it's going to be long enough, it gave me the time to exercise pretty much every single day because I get into my little routine of getting up, doing some exercise, checking my work emails just to make sure nothing had kind of happened. Um, you know, and then kind of sitting, checking them obsessively. And in a way, actually, I think I started exercising multiple times a day to stop me checking my emails. And I just started to really enjoy that time outside and that time walking. And then in January, the really awful weather hit. It was really frosty. You know, walking was just a perilous activity, even in walking boots. And I realised how much of an impact it was having going from doing, you know, I was doing like 30,000 steps a day almost every day pretty much last year to basically for the whole month of January you could barely leave the house. It was snow, it was ice, it was awful. And so I decided to buy a treadmill, basically, to get to the, get to the freaking point. And I measured it and you know when like... You know when you measure your space and you measure what you can fit into your space and it makes sense on paper and then it arrives and it doesn't make sense? That happened. So basically the treadmill went back. It's the long story short of the first purchase of February. I hadn't really thought about what would happen if I made a purchase and returned it. But I decided ultimately this is about buying one thing a month. It's about one thing a month entering my life. Like I feel like it would be against the spirit of the project to buy things with an intention to return them so I wouldn't be doing that but if I buy something and it's not right and it goes back then I've not physically brought that item into my life so I decided I'm good to buy something else in place of the treadmill that I didn't keep and I do have to say had the space worked out I do still feel that the treadmill would be a really valuable thing for me to have. That also got me down a path of I can't fit this treadmill into my space because I have got so much stuff in my space. Like, and it, and it's always that point where when something's new and shiny and you've just got it, you like it more than you like everything else that you already own. Like, we, we've all been there, we all know what that feeling is. Like, that is essentially, that is essentially what got me down the rabbit hole of over-consuming in the first place is that as soon as you've owned something for a while, the, the shine comes off it, particularly if it's been an impulse purchase, which most of mine were, pre you know by. So, do you know that way I was trying to make this treadmill work, could not make it work. And I was just like, I just want to bin everything in this room that would, you know, whatever the amount of stuff I need to bin to fit this treadmill in, I'm just going to do it. And obviously I didn't, because that would be incredibly wasteful and you know just a sort of quick reflex and nobody makes good decisions about what stuff they need or don't need when they're trying to like quickly reflex fitting in a brand new item that they are excited about so th but that is where the emotions were I was just like I am being stopped from having this thing that I feel would bring, bring real value into my life and we're now at the end of March and I'm still here to say I still think not so much now because I can get back out because the weather has cleared up but January and February were a write-off in terms of 
being able to get out because February was miserable as well um, and I'm only just getting back into getting out and doing proper I mean I do a couch to 5k and then I just walk basically it's not that I'm out running marathons at all but I feel so much happier in my body um, which is something we're going to talk about later in the video in terms of getting out then I did like January and February were horrible months in terms of how I physically felt not because you know not doing this exercise suddenly meant I was putting on loads of weight because I haven't put on loads of weight but I just felt you know sluggish and lethargic and I don't want to make it about weight but I felt bigger even though like I wasn't it which I know is there's a whole other underpinning to that which is about the way that women are valued for their bodies and you know that all probably needs unpacked but the bottom line is I feel better when I exercise and I do think that treadmill would be a good thing to have in my life but I can't fit it in because I have too much stuff so that was what I was thinking in the moment when I had it and I was ready to just like bin everything and now I've kind of calmed down a little bit but I would still like to have less stuff and be able to add a treadmill into my life but I'm not quite so ready to do it the knee jerk like let's just pick a bag and throw it out kind of thing. To move on from that my whole plan sort of originally was that I was going to get the treadmill and obviously the intention had been to keep the treadmill and what I had been thinking about past that was to have a no buy in March because if I don't buy a thing in a month I can roll the item over. So I wanted to kind of have that safety blanket of moving March's item forward when I thought February's was accounted for by the treadmill and then I wanted to buy things together and I'm also aware just in general at this point that my holidays, what I've done with my holidays this year is that so last year my holidays and my travel expenditure was out with my budget and it didn't count as a breaking of my no buy which lol ended up no holidays last year but it is what it is that was what I'd started out at the start of the year this year I have if I want to go on holiday then I have to take that as one of my month's items that I'm paying for um so at this point I thought I'm going away twice in July and the balance of one of those holidays needs to be paid in June and the balance of the second one which is actually more August than it is July needs to be paid at the start of July so I was kind of like right I, I need two months there to pay those holidays since then basically my Dublin holiday has now been moved to December just in terms of restrictions and not kind of knowing where things are going to be in July and I'm going to London twice in July but my gran is paying for the first holiday as my birthday present so I don't need to actually take that as a month now but at the time that I was thinking about this that was when I was. So in a way I was thinking two items are spoken for and I know that I want a dress for my birthday and a pair of shoes to go with it so I was kind of like right that's another two so that's four items and in theory at this point I was like right so January's been the shoes and February's been a treadmill so I was like right I've got March, April, May, June and July and I want to have the dress and the shoes for July and then I want to pay the two holidays so that really was only leaving me one month kind of you know free and the other side of it is that the dress was showing as out of stock but you could order one to be made but they needed three months so I thought I'm going to need to order this dress like April kind of May time to make sure it's here for July which may still be the case because it's currently still out of stock but it's now pending a restock so I don't know when that restock's happening I need to email them about that because I do still want that dress but anyway so what I was kind of thinking was like right if I roll March over then I've got the dress to buy in April slash May the other thing is the dress is really expensive so it's not just the quantity side of it it's also making sure I had a little bit more money set back to buy the most expensive dress that I've ever bought in my whole life we're going to get on to dresses later and then the other thing that I've written down that I started thinking about at that point as well is because that only left me one kind of item left over that wasn't the dress and shoes for my birthday or the two holidays I started thinking about the self-portrait dress and the Christian Dior belt that had been on my wish list in January 
they have now been pulled off my wish list because I started thinking about them and I now can't even remember what the exact prices are but say I think the dress was around the 400 mark and the belt was around the 600 mark I was a bit like oh well if I get the dress like the belt's kind of core as such like there will always be black Dior belts like I particularly had picked one that I liked but I do think it would probably still be in stock in like July and August when I went on holiday and I could buy it as a holiday purchase but I was like oh if I buy the dress and then I was kind of thinking I'm about to drop all this money on this dress from the vampire's wife for my birthday and I'm thinking about that and that like you know that feeling you get when you're about to drop like a lot of money and you're like oh I wasn't getting that about buying the self-portrait dress and the Dior belt because I was thinking about them separately and then I was a bit like that's over a thousand pounds near enough together I think the dress might the belt might even be 650 like it was around the thousand pounds mark and I was like I'm like the fact this dress that I want is a four figure sum is making me be like oh but I'm thinking about buying these two items separately that add up to it. admittedly not as much as the dress but still a four figure sum and that, that when I start thinking about them together that starts to make me be like do I really want to drop that much money on these two like oh I don't know and as soon as I started thinking about it like that and having those doubts I pulled those items off my wish list and it was just that considering them together if I considered them still separately it, it would not bothered me so that was also part of my thought process. The next thing that I started thinking about was that I had Space NK points to spend that were going to run out I think they expired in March and I had £15 worth of Space NK points or was it 50, was it 10 or 50? Anyway I had Space NK points I've not actually written down how many I had and I started like thinking about trying to get the use out of them because I was like oh I don't want these points to expire even though points are something they do have a monetary value but ultimately they are something you acquire as a bonus. It becomes this thing, this is, I mean this is why brands do loyalty programs like Space NK and Boots because basically if I have something that I need to buy, those are my first two stops that will need to buy in the sense of like you know toiletries or like skincare replacements which I know generally 90% of which I probably don't need to buy to stay alive but you know what I mean something I want to buy, something I'm going to buy, those are my first two points of call because I get points. So it definitely is worthwhile for brands to, to do these loyalty schemes because I feel like I'm getting something back when I shop with those brands that I'm not getting if I buy it from, like I have a My John Lewis card but you don't get points or like you know sometimes you get like a free coffee in the, the cafe or whatever but you're not really getting those same rewards back whereas it feels like when you get points that you can spend on something it feels more like you're being handed free money but then you've got this free money and Boots points don't expire thankfully but Space NK points do and it becomes this thing that you don't want to lose this free money that you've been handed because it's actually not free money it's money that you have got as a result of spending but also at the same time, if you had bought what you'd bought from Space NK to get those points from John Lewis is probably the easiest one because Liberty does have a Liberty gives you points and you get like a voucher. Harry's gives you points that you get a voucher. Say right, so Selfridges. Selfridges, John Lewis, you wouldn't get those points if you spent that same money with them, so you wouldn't be thinking about spending the points at this point. But these points expiring it felt like I'd be throwing £15 away even though like the £15 is a bonus. Do you know what I mean? Like I don't know if I'm explaining this very well. It starts to feel like you're not going to lose it because it, it would feel like throwing away money because I had Space NK points that expired during my no buy year last year and I was so annoyed about them. So it feels like you're throwing away money even though it's money that you wouldn't have had to spend if you'd bought what you bought with another retailer in the first place and then also it's £15 like in the grand scheme of Space NK it's not getting you very much is it? I started thinking about how I would really like because at this point I still thought I was going to Dublin a set of the Patchology Illuminating sheet masks which I really really do like I think most sheet masks are much of a muchness but these ones are particularly good so I started thinking I would get them and use the £15 towards it and then I was like oh, that would need to be 
my item for the month at this point because it's not a replacement it's just I would be buying it to get the points kind of thing and then I would have had to pay postage and that's what then stopped me which is a whole other thing is that I didn't want to pay postage basically I ended up my body scrub was running out so I just ended up using it for a replacement rather than buying something new and ended up I still did have to pay postage but at the start of the month I kind of thought the shops might have been reopening before my points would expire so I was a bit like oh, if I hold off I can maybe get them in store and I wouldn't need to pay postage what is I think by the time I was buying the body scrub it was like right before they expired and I knew that there was no way the shops were reopening before they expired kind of thing so that was the the resolution of that but that whole that whole thing happened to my head when I thought about buying the sheet masks and then stopped because I didn't want to pay postage. So, yeah. Also, for brands, from a brand's point of view, if you'd been giving me free postage, which Cult Beauty do for all orders over £20, which the sheet mask would have been over £20, I would have been checking out. It was the postage that stopped me. So, from a brand's point of view, free postage is going to get you more orders. But from a trying not to buy things so much point of view, postage was what stopped me. So grateful to the postage, grateful to Space NK for being stingy. Just to clarify, I don't expect small businesses to give free postage, but I feel like if Cult Beauty can do it for orders over £20, Space NK could as well. Anyway, so to circle back slightly to what I was saying about I was maybe going to do a no buy because I was trying to build up the money to have to spend on the dress. This started a whole other thing when I started thinking about small items and this is where the fact that I've gone down this quantity route rather than the budget route this year, like I think it's still the right way for me to have gone about it because it is more about clutter and stuff that I want to cut down on than it is like ugh, I do want to be better financially and I want to be spending less and I think next year I don't know what my plans are next year yet because obviously I need to see how things are at the end of this year um, but I think I want to do something that is more of a cap on my money next year in some way or form I'm not sure what that is yet but we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it but I feel like this year the quantity route is still the right one for me if I had a budget I think I would slip into this habit of wanting to spend the whole budget and if I bought a small item I would use the rest of the budget whereas in this this way if I buy a small item by small I mean like a small ticket like a low cost item whereas this way if I really like say a dress that's from Topshop or whatever which is not a thing anymore but it is on ASOS but you know what I mean, like a fast fashion dress or something that pre no by me would have bought without thinking about. If I decide that I want that fast fashion item enough to purchase it and it's say £40, if I had a £200 budget I'd spend the other £160, whereas this way it makes me really weigh up do I want that as much as I want? The vampire's wife dress that I want for my birthday. The way this is working is that it has to be that level of want for me to commit to something and it's it's good in a way because it is making me measure all of these items and all of these purchases that I would have made pre no buy in a previous mindset without thinking about because it's putting them all on this even playing field. They're all just one item. That is the good side of it but I also want to be able to balance that with finding joy in small pleasures and not like I feel like sort of problem with how I got into this whole rabbit hole was because I was chasing happiness in items which I want to change and I thought I had changed but I'm now questioning whether I have actually changed that through my no buy year or not like I've definitely I'm not saying that I'm back to where I was before at all like I'm definitely definitely not but putting all these things on this even platform as a quantity purchase item it's like I want to be able to find joy in the small things because I think regardless of whether you're talking about like the financial side of it or the stuff side of it or just like living life on a daily basis and trying to be mindful and 
you know, aware of what is truly important is that no matter what sort of school of thought you talk about or you research, these things come down to the small things. Do you know what I mean? It's small daily joys add up to being better for you overall than one big holiday a year or something like that. I want to, in a way, be able to find joys in the small purchases, like if it is, if like there's a dress from River Island that I love at the moment that I really, really want, and I want to be able to buy that dress from River Island and feel the same joy from it as I do buying a dress from the vampire's wife. And that was what my thought process in the quantity control approach for this year was, was to ensure that if I did buy the small things, they sparked as much, they were as well thought through and sparked as much joy as the bigger things because I feel like for me beforehand, I was always chasing, like say I'd want a pair of like Dolce & Gabbana shoes and a dress from the vampire's wife and I'd be like, oh, it's so much money, you know, blah, blah, blah. I really can't afford that, like, whatever. And then I'd go and buy, like, you know, three dresses from Topshop and a pair of shoes from River Island and a pair of shoes from Kurt Geiger and a bag from Reese or whatever. And all this stuff together would have made up the amount that I would have spent just buying the one thing I really wanted. And none of them ever felt like that was the thing I really wanted. It was always, I was trying to plug the hole of what it was I was actually coveting and that was that was the big point of this year was look if you can control the quantity of what you buy you can buy the one thing you really want and I, I do still think that is the right way to go but I have caught myself sort of issuing things that are smaller purchases because I still would inherently value like a designer item over a high street item and to that way I can it's so difficult because there's the whole environmental impact that if you buy better you buy once rather than buying 10 items of fast fashion you know and if you buy things that you're going to wear over and over again that you're going to love for a really long time rather than buying things that are trend led that's so much better for the environment but I also feel like I am at a point now where I don't really think I'm buying trend-led items. I'm sure I probably am in the way that to an extent anything that's in a shop is in a shop because they think it's going to sell because it is in the current style forecast. But I do think I'm at a point where I look at something and I know if it's me or not. So I don't think I really buy it. I don't think I've ever really been that much of a trend person. Like... I feel like the big trend that I remember, the last one that I really like loved from social media was the Zara Scort of 2013, I think. And disco pants, like they really stand out for me as being trends that I bought into that I really loved. Um, but I feel like for the most part, I'm not so much of a trend led buyer. So I feel like even if I buy fast fashion, I have it in my wardrobe for a really long time because I don't really buy things that I get rid of because they've gone out of style. I tend to, when I'm getting rid of things, it tends to be that I've bought something that I wanted a better version of to start with. And that's kind of what I'm trying to get around, but I'm also trying to get around that without wanting to give too much power to getting the best version of something because I think that's the hole that I might be in danger of going into this year. It's like trying to find what you really want to really assess that and to get the version that you do really, really want because I know from experience, if you buy 10 imitation versions, it never fills the hole, but also to be able to make peace with the version you can afford. Does that make sense? Because like, I want this dress from The Vampire's Wife for my birthday and I do want it and I'm, you know, I've wanted it for ages and I'm, it's my birthday and I've decided I'm having it. But I also can't afford to buy dresses at that price point every week. Well, not even every week, every month. Like, I couldn't buy, like, as much as I've got 12 items that I can buy this year, the ones that I've spent obviously notwithstanding, I don't have the financial means to buy 12 dresses at £1,600 a pop. Like, that's not my life. And it's trying to find that balance of going, this is what I really want, this is what I can afford, and this is 
the place in the middle that's I'm going to be happy with what I've got not still pining for the other version but also not giving the other version so much power and so much importance does that make sense I really this this is why I kept putting off filming this video because I don't feel that I have worked through these things enough to articulate them well so I think I need to move on from this point because I don't think I'm making it I think I'm just going in circles but yeah it's tr trying to make peace with smaller things and like genuinely making peace with them and making sure they give me as much joy as bigger things but maybe that's less about bringing the small things up and more about giving less power to the big things does that make sense i hope that makes sense let's move on to the next point or we'll be here forever we're already going to be here forever the other thing that i have written down here that i think is maybe worth just taking note of at this point because this could change as the year goes on is that we are still in lockdown at the moment so my budget spends are under budget I've not gone over budget any month and obviously I do my budget check-in separately but I feel like I maybe think I have more money than I actually do at the moment because and I talked about this in my last budget check-in my money doesn't need to stretch that far at the moment because we've been in lockdown it's going to have to start stretching a bit further and I feel like the money side of it will become a bit tighter when things start reopening which they do as of when you're watching this in Scotland Monday um obviously I can't speak for where else you know check check your own government guidelines and I think like maybe as well the reality of that hasn't quite hit in yet this year because as much as yes I have my budget and then I have my unbudgeted item that I can buy in the grand scheme of things I also have the overall budget of my salary and how much I'm trying to save every month because I do want to buy a house but yeah it, it's all a thing like there is as much as my spend is unbudgeted on my item it's budgeted by reality and by life so that is a thing but I feel like that's maybe not kicking in quite so much yet because I don't think I'm thinking that much about budgeting yet even though I am because I'm still budgeting every month but I don't think I'm facing the struggle properly of budgeting yet so I think maybe when the budgeting becomes more of a struggle that will impact on this side of it because I might be more like oh actually I need more money for this so I'm going to buy my replacement this month rather than thinking about this sort of endless list of things that I want so that I'm using this side of it to alleviate the difficulty of the budgeting. The next thing I've written down is just to put it into context. I was also listening to the picture of Doreen Gray at this point and there's an awful lot of quotes in that that were making me really uncomfortable about how Doreen Gray, so if you don't know the story, is that Doreen Gray, like this portrait starts to, he essentially like makes a deal with the devil without realising that he's done it. He doesn't do it intentionally as such which I think is actually in a way the scariest thing because I think what he says to kind of start this whole process off is something so many of us would say maybe not say aloud but that we would think rather than like consciously sitting down like you know one of those scenes from like one of those horror films where you call the devil and you know whatever happens um it's, it's subconscious he doesn't do it consciously but basically he has this portrait and it starts to age instead of him because he values his youth and his looks and beauty essentially so much that you know this kind of horrible thing happens and there's just a lot of quotes from Dorian Gray earlier on in the book that are just really sort of it's just about the val the valuing of the shallow things in life and how much he does value them. But I would hope obviously I don't value them enough that I would enter into a supernatural deal of having all the things that I want in exchange for uh, my soul or whatever but there were some things that he was saying that don't actually sound all that extreme or different from how I feel about aesthetic things and it's trying again it's all about that balance it's trying to find this way of saying do you know what it's okay to an extent to value things and to value aesthetics and to want things to look a certain way and to be nice 
but it's not letting it take over it's not having a cursed portrait in the attic that was what really kind of struck me at the book as I was listening to it is just kind of how easily the whole start of it actually happens because it doesn't sound like he says anything in the grand scheme of life all that dramatic it's just that he's like oh I really want to be young and whatever forever and blah 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 and everybody's kind of said that at some point do you know what I mean like maybe not so much about the youth but you want your perception of beauty to stay does that make sense but yeah it was making me quite uncomfortable basically so then I've written I'm quite all we've covered that I'm quite all or nothing and then I've written I want a healthier relationship with shopping where I buy better and consider things more which is what the year of one is based on is making those considerations really consciously before committing to purchases but in the long run I want to get to a point where I can become relaxed around it and do it intuitively but I feel like this is it's almost like what I've likened it to here is like a binge eater needing a structured eating plan to teach them how and what to eat in a facility that then works towards intuitive eating you know it's it you you kind of need to do these baby steps and I feel like maybe what I want to do is fast forward to being able to well it's not maybe what I want to do what I do want to do is be able to fast forward to being able to show up in a way that I can control that makes me happy enough with what I buy but I'm financially happy and I don't feel controlled and consumed by it controlled and consumed by my own consumerism it's the thing but I feel like I maybe need to accept a bit more like when I'm getting stressed about this that I am I'm taking steps and I'm doing this self-prescribed plan that I'm making up as I go along and that's that's what I need to do and I need to make peace with I need to make peace with the fact that I'm doing this and have stuff to make peace with does that make sense that sounds ridiculous but it's like I'm just getting so worked up about not striking the balance and not doing this and not doing that and it's 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 a process and I need to stop treating it as if there's like a fast forward button that I should be able to press because there isn't I just need to go through it and I just need to reflect on all this stuff to get to where I want to be so that's a thing I then whilst I was like thinking about the fact I needed to make peace with that and not making peace with that I got myself very worked up and I started really reflecting on do I need anything right now like we're in a climate in a lockdown I'm going to work in back the shoes that I bought in January, because this is February's notes we're still on by the way. The shoes that I bought in January have not even been worn yet. Do I really want to increase this amount of stuff that I've got because I couldn't get a treadmill that I wanted because of the amount of stuff that I've got? And I was like, no, I don't want to buy anything. And that, and like to an extent that's, it's good that I was feeling that way because I feel like beforehand I was like a dragon that was like, sitting on its treasure and I just wanted to accumulate this treasure not because I wanted to do anything with it because I've talked about this before when I was buying things problematically I was buying them bringing them home and shoving them in a cupboard and then I was out wanting the next hit I was wanting the next thing that I could get because I was convinced that there was going to be something at some point that I could buy that was going to make me so happy that you know that it would last whereas it never lasted it was just this little spike of joy when I handed the money over and got a bag with something that I was like oh look I bought this and then like you know by the time I'd be getting home I didn't want to have to answer any questions on what I'd bought so I'd be like shoving it in my handbag coming up the stairs shoving it in the back of the wardrobe like pretending it never happened and not using the things that I was accumulating but somehow feeling that owning all this stuff was the right path to making myself happier so I'm glad that in my annoyance I was very much like I don't need any more stuff like because that is the mindset that I want to be connecting with but I also want to be able to connect with it in a less angry way because I was very angry at this point like I was just like completely in this sort of all or nothing mindset where at that point all consumption was ridiculous and nobody should be buying anything which is not uh, again it's it's that struggle with moderation like I want to consume things that's why I'm doing the year of one about because I do like things but it just yeah 
I think maybe overall I'd still rather be in the mindset of going I want nothing <laughs> than in the mindset of going I want to accumulate all the stuff that I'm never going to use just because it will make me feel better to think about how much I own. Like, it's an improvement but it was a very extreme improvement and I don't want it to be that extreme. I think the whole balance and less extreme is the are the buzz buzzwords of this video. Moving on from my annoyance, I went down this whole thing about A, it's the mental clutter, it's the amount of time that I spent getting angry last month about the amount of stuff that I own, the amount of time that I just spent thinking and reflecting on that, as much as obviously I'm making this video and I'm still thinking and reflecting on it, is like there's better uses of my time than to spend hours of my life getting frustrated about stuff. So it's the mental clutter of that, but it's also then the hours of my life that I start dedicating to thinking about how to fix the physical clutter. So the whole, as you can see, I've got these two tall chests behind me and then there's a smaller one there. Now basically, to get the treadmill in, at least two of them have got to go. And I started, like a woman possessed, but I'll be honest, like this furniture setup is really not working for me. This is another one where I made something on paper and it worked and then I've set it up and it really doesn't work. But basically I started measuring the space that's there and thinking about how to get something that could go the other way against like the wall that's over there rather than against the back wall because there's not really a lot of space in front of it to get into it, blah blah blah. So I was then like trying to find something that would be the maximum width that it could be to fit into the space that's side on against that wall that would maybe take like one and a half chests of drawers worth of stuff and then that would let me get rid of like and then if I could get rid of a certain amount of stuff then you know the, and then basically I only needed to get rid of like half a chest worth of stuff and the small stuff and that way I could get this new bit of furniture in that would store my stuff and then I could get the treadmill in and it's not, it's just the amount of time I spent thinking about that, planning it, looking up furniture online, and then it sort of hit me that I am sitting thinking about buying this temporary IKEA unit because it fits space-wise what I want it to, when I don't even like it that much. I want to move out and I certainly don't want to be humping this piece of like cheap IKEA furniture that I would have bought because it fitted my needs in this sort of really like worked up emotional state reaction to wanting to fit something else in and then I was like I'm so stressed about the amount of stuff that I own that I am thinking about buying something to store it better rather than actually just thinking have less stuff like n never mind clearing out a certain amount then I could get a different drawer and then I can put it here and then this could fit and just just can just concentrate on getting rid of the stuff and the space will start to work around the amount of stuff that I own rather than me trying to figure out storage solutions to make it appear like I have less stuff. Does that make sense? So that was a whole scenario and anyway so then I sort of had that whole chat with myself and I thought I need to sort of reconnect with what it is I'm actually trying to do here. So. I went on to Netflix and I watched The Minimalists Less Is Now, first of all, which was just, it was The Minimalists um, sort of talking about their approach and just what it's about and minimalism, etc. And it's very American, so just a heads up for anyone who is not American, it's very, very American in the way that it's sort of presented and things, but it did, it, it helped me sort of refocus on my bigger picture goals and there was, I can't remember what the line is, I should have written it down, but there was a line in it about like the storage space industry and how people are like outliving their spaces and th their thoughts are to find storage for their stuff rather than to have less stuff and it was basically like exactly what I had just spent all this time and energy like working myself up about with the whole trying to get a treadmill in and trying to get rid of stuff like it was like a sign it was it was just one of those creepy right thing at the right time kind of moments maybe what I need to do is start watching that on like a monthly basis just to 
reconnect with it so that it keeps it in the forefront of my mind that this is what I am aiming towards rather than like getting worked up about it just to take that step back and reconnect with the sort of core I'm not necessarily saying I want to become a minimalist because I definitely like I want slightly excessive amounts of stuff like I'm definitely a stuff person but I just want and this is again this is all toned into this balance is that that approach to minimalism that's like you own nothing in your life that is neither functional nor beautiful like which opens up that sort of great area where you can have stuff that serves no function just because it brings you joy because it's beautiful and that's fine but it's just making sure it brings you enough joy that it's worth having in your life and not just like oh well yeah that makes me vaguely happy so I'll keep it like do you know what I mean but it's also again you don't necessarily need it's it's that way that it's that balance of wanting the best version of what you want so that you can just have that one and it'll be perfect but not getting so worked up about stuff either I've, there's very contradictory ideas I think but there has to be a balance somewhere and that is what we are in search of on this channel I watched that and then sort of was like I need less stuff I am so at peace with this idea I have reconnected with this idea like I am not getting worked up about what I want and then in this sort of very zen mind frame, I made my purchase for the month of February, which was this Katie Jane Fuse Spectrum brush set, which was, I think, £160. And I kind of made it in this sort of, I've never been high, I've never done drugs, but I feel like that's almost what I was on in this sort of minimalism thing. Because I bought this and I was a bit like, oh, like this fits the aesthetic, so it's green, which... The aesthetic is very up my street. Um, but I was a bit like, oh, like, and then all my brushes would just match and I can just get rid of all my other brushes. And, it, you know, my vanity is going to look so much more streamlined and so much more minute. But it was, it was a purchase that was very much buying into the aesthetic of minimalism where I thought, I will have these brushes and they will all match and it will look lovely in my dressing table and I can get rid of all the other brushes that I own. And long story short, lads, Still using all the other brushes because I'm still it sounds really silly if you're not into makeup but I'm still kind of learning how to use these brushes like they deposit a lot less pigment than I'm used to like it's taking me a lot longer to do my makeup with these than it does with the other brushes that I'm already aware of how much pigment they deposit and how to kind of work them with different things so we're having a process with this and I'm not quite ready to say that I regret purchasing them but like they've certainly not been this sort of magical purchase that I had totally in this sort of weird hazy state decided they would be where I would get rid of every other brush that I owned because I had these and I think that's a little bit of again like things happen for a reason and maybe that happened to show me that whilst I am kind of saying that one of my problems in the past has been that I have bought you know, 10 imitation versions of something trying to fill the want for the sort of better version that I couldn't afford or couldn't justify and then spending the same amount of money chasing them with lesser versions. There's also maybe part of me that works up this perfect version, which these were going to be perfect and they're not. And that's maybe not a shortcoming because maybe I had worked these brushes up to be perfect more than they would ever advertise that they were going to be perfect and yeah I probably didn't research them enough and I feel like now that I'm looking at Katie's style her makeup style is very different to mine in a lot of ways and the ways that she applies products and stuff so actually maybe brushes that she designed were never going to fit my aesthetic in the way that I like to apply products and you know, so it's, it's kind of one of those ones where I want to be researching my stuff more because I think maybe with a bit more research I might have not bought these so much. I don't know. I don't know if that's true or not. I, and I can't know that's the problem. Like, but yeah, I bought, <laughs> I definitely sort of thought these were going to be these magical top end brushes and 
I was going to get rid of all my other ones that are all, you know, some have Real Techniques handles and some have MAC handles and some have Zoeva handles and, like, just part of me loved the idea that all my brushes were all going to be these green handles and they were just going to be in this, like, green container and I would have one container in my dressing table and it was going to tick this sort of minimalist aesthetic box that actually the brushes that I have already suit my purposes and I'd have maybe been better buying a couple of backups of certain brushes that I use all the time rather than buying these in some misguided attempt to replace them all. So that's where we are with my February purchase and as I say I'm not necessarily regretting buying them, I think I just need more time with the brushes and more time to get used to them. But in terms of how I feel at this very moment, if I could go back in time, I would stop myself buying them. So maybe I do regret buying them. I don't, it's not like I regret buying them, like I look at them and I think, oh god, like I hate that I own you. I don't. I'm using them, like they're, they're functioning, they're playing a role. But yeah, I think if I had, if I had a time machine and I could undo a purchase, I probably would undo the brushes because in terms of like I've not been wearing a lot of makeup recently and just because I really have only been going to work and that's pretty much been it but yeah just because those ones take more time like for quickness and simplicity I'm using the same brushes I always used unless it's like a Saturday or Sunday and I have get the time to do my makeup which yeah like sometimes I do want to sit down and take the time to do my makeup but even then it's more about the makeup that I want to take my time with and I want the brushes that I know exactly how to use. Does that make sense? I'm really, I don't think I'm a trick. I don't hate that I've bought them, but I would unbuy them if I could. To then move on to March, finally getting to March. I don't have as much written down about March, but I do think there's a whole sort of gender politics thing that gets sparked off in March for me. So my March purchase, again, we had a buy and a return to start with. And I bought the Vampire's Wife t-shirt that was the little black cat with his cigarette which I thought was a really really cute design. I loved it. Loved it so much. And then it arrived and I put it on and I just didn't love it on me. It just, it was a kind of unisex cut t-shirt. I am a curvy person. I need things that come in at my waist and or, or I just like, if I get things that go from my chest straight down I just look like a big oblong. Like, it didn't suit me at all. In a way, it was one of those ones, like, sometimes if I get, like, a cheaper t-shirt that's made from, like, thinner, stretchier material, it clings to my body a bit more and actually looks better. Whereas, in a way, this was a better quality t-shirt, so it was thicker cotton, but then it was more rigid and even more boxy because of it. So it just didn't flatter me, and I sent it back. I still love the design. I would still like the design somehow incorporated into a more flattering garment because I love that little cat with the signet. I was just so here for it. He was so cool in a very unhealthy way. Do not promote smoking kids like but this cat with his signet I just loved. And I still love the design but yeah the t-shirt on me was just not the one. This set off a whole thing for me where I was thinking about minimalism and the aesthetics of minimalism which I'd obviously bought into with the Katie Jane Hughes brushes and the whole t-shirt and jeans. I feel like so many minimalists and capsule wardrobe people are like a really good white t-shirt like it's a wardrobe basic and you should really invest into that and it'll go with everything and you'll wear it all the time and I was a bit like not if you're like a size 12, 34G chested person with a small waist and bigger head. Like, no, you, a white t-shirt really only works on certain body shapes. And mine is not one of them. And I feel like this gets into this whole thing for me where there's something I think about the minimalism aesthetic that feels exclusionary to so many people who I think actually would buy into the idea of minimalism like myself because in terms of like the home aesthetic of minimalism like all that you know super white like 
white counters etc like not there's an irony to me saying this in a white bedroom but not up my street at all you know I, that's not the kind of home that I want to own or to create or to live in and the minimalist capsule wardrobe aesthetic is all these neutral tones and good quality basics and white t-shirts and blah 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 and I'm just not thrilled by it at all and I think as well as not being thrilled by it at a taste level an awful lot of these things are for very very skinny people and I'm sorry there's I know to an extent anybody can wear what they want like anybody can have any garment put on it and the body is wearing the garment and if you are somebody who is like you know whatever size you are and you feel brilliant in a white t-shirt like good for you but I don't personally it's not my style it doesn't suit me it doesn't flatter me but I feel like to feel like you're a member of the minimalist club you need to have a good quality white t-shirt. Do you know what I mean? This got me down this whole sort of rabbit hole and I'm probably not going to articulate a lot of this very well but I feel like this was a whole rabbit hole that I think needs looked into further in the wider scheme of this is that size wise I feel like it's so much easier to own less stuff if you have a body that you're at a very comfortable size and your body stays at that size whereas if you're somebody whose weight fluctuates as like I am somebody whose weight fluctuates and whose size therefore fluctuates you almost need to have a wardrobe with like three sizes in it because it sometimes feels like that fluctuation can happen over the space of two weeks where you can have lost or gained a dress size and particularly like I mean I get definitely bloated around my period but like I've got a friend that will put on half a stone to £10 on the week of our period and lose it the next week. You know she goes up her dress size on her period and I can't remember exactly. She does have, I think it might be polycystic ovaries, you know she has a condition that does mean her periods are really really painful on her and cause a lot of stress on her body that goes beyond the sort of stress that normal women go through in their periods but even like I had my period last week and I was wearing jeans that I would wear today and feel a bit baggy and getting a little bit big for me and my stomach was like pressed against them and I was so uncomfortable and how can you have a minimalist closet with 33 items if you need those items to stretch across like three sizes which a lot of women do and the, do you know what I mean it's I find that I don't feel like that is taken into account enough when we sell people the idea of minimalism and capsule wardrobes. There's not really that space for people whose bodies fluctuate and I feel like it feels like an exclusionary space to those people because of that. So that is a whole thing. But also I think there's a whole other sort of sexist side of it. Not that minimalism is in and of itself sexist but I think it's a lot easier for men and I think there's a lot more high profile men doing minimalism because I think women are programmed from such an early age in a way that men are not that how they appear matters so much more than it does for men and you know because we've all seen these horrible studies where like you know people will be showing a picture of a woman with and without makeup and you know they will think the woman who is with makeup is smarter they'd be more likely to offer her a better salary they'd offer her a better paid job you know the the attributes that they give to her face because she's wearing makeup or because she's smiling whereas she's not in the other picture are all so much more positive whereas the reaction to a woman you know not smiling or not wearing makeup will be like oh like you know she looks moody like I'd offer her like less money you know it, it, and this isn't women overreacting this is literally like it comes down to a woman who presents herself in a certain way will be offered a higher salary than a woman who doesn't present herself in that way and of course that is applicable to men too of course it is like as a society we do value looks too much so of course it's applicable to men but I think those differences are more stark with men it's you know and again weight comes into it where we know 
as a society that we look at overweight people and you know we start saying that they are lazy um Sarah Manning who is an author who's lost a tremendous amount of weight she's talked about this where she went for an eye test when she was at one of her sort of biggest times I believe and the optician presumed that she would be getting a free eye test because they presumed she was on some kind of income support because she was bigger like that's not made up that's not somebody being paranoid about what people are assuming about them that is literally somebody made and voiced that opinion and she had to say I'm no I'm paying for my eye test like I'm I'm not on income support because this person had made this assumption because of her size so sizeism is across all genders binaries non-binaries like all humans there's a difference between a man who is three stone lighter than another man turning up wearing a suit with a really short haircut and comparing that to somebody who is very overweight, has, you know, long, like, unkempt hair and is wearing casual clothes, whereas you, you can be talking about a woman who looks the same based on a different outfit and different makeup and she is perceived so differently to herself wearing no makeup. Like, it's mad. And women know that that's going on and it's so difficult, I think, for women to start unpicking what what it is for not just it's not just that women who want to be more minimalist need to unpick their own sort of issues where they've maybe given too much importance to stuff and become too materialistic and too driven by you know consumption and too like you know doing what I was doing where I was a bit like if I have this very expensive handbag everyone that's looking at me is going to know like oh she's got a Chanel handbag like she's a success it's it's not just unpicking what you've attributed to the signifiers that you've decided to spend too much when you know you're false gods as such it's the fact that as women we know that we are being judged far more harshly than men are on our appearance and it's you know it's trying to unpick not just yourself but everybody else's perception to it and I know that and definitely we think people care far more than they do but it's a lot easier to sort of say that in isolation than it is to apply that to society as a whole in the way that women are judged and women are judged on their appearance and I don't think it is remotely a coincidence that an awful lot of the time when you are dealing with women who are trying to have less stuff and get into the sort of minimalism headspace it often starts with their wardrobe because that is where most women have this overflowing amount of stuff whereas men are maybe more likely from what I have seen from the from what I've consumed so all of this is very much through my personal framework of who I've come across but men are maybe more likely to like you know they will have clothing but it's gadgets it's too many dvds it's too many cds it's whatever women quite often like other areas of their life can be in control but their wardrobes are stressing them out because they're over they're overflowing with stuff um and i've obviously i've spoken about uh, yes my wardrobe was part of it but beauty products were a massive part of my issue and the more I was thinking about it, the more I was like, I grew up, like, the sort of teenage years of my life, a lot of the films that I was watching had the makeover scene. And what that promotes is that your face can actually stay the same and you can stay the same. Because most of these people's makeover scenes did not involve plastic surgery or dramatic weight loss or whatever. They would stay the same. And they would just get a different haircut, makeup and clothes and everyone in the film would start to react differently. So whether it's like, I think she's all that's the one where like the geek gets the makeover and then gets the guy. You've got the princess diaries where, you know, she's got unkempt hair and she's wearing her glasses and then, you know, they take that off and do some makeup and she's a princess. And the devil wears Prada is another Anne Hathaway classic where, you know, she's doesn't fit in at runway and she's not being admired and she's not feeling and that one in a way is slightly different because it's less about 
slightly less about other people's perceptions of her, although it is definitely still about that, but maybe to a lesser extent is that the clothes then help her feel more part of her job, but she shouldn't, she also shouldn't have to just because Metal Street's character switch. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's so many sort of makeovers, like Mean Girls, you know, Lindsay Lohan comes in and she's got her flannel, um, what's it, like flannel shirt and her jeans and then, you know, she becomes one of the plastics and she starts dressing differently and that's her ticket from being a normal person going through school to being in this like top tier social group as was sort of seen at the time. And like, I think there's been a backlash to that. I, th I think we're in a, a far better place now, um, politically wise for women, obviously so far to go and gender politics in general have so far to go. Um, but I do think there's maybe less of that kind of going on in modern TV shows and films and things, which is, I feel like the makeover scene was a big sort of trope for quite a while and it fed people my age and maybe slightly older who were still seeing those films in the cinema this sort of notion that you know you can stay the same as you are but if you get a new wardrobe and some makeup and you do your hair a bit differently everyone in the world is going to react differently to you and it's it's very difficult I think to unpick your own perceptions of stuff and your own importance and stuff when you have that in the back of your mind that this isn't just about you and your perceptions it is the way that society as a whole will perceive you and will react to you is so based on how you present yourself in a way that it's just not to the same extent for men. Does that make sense? I feel like there's a whole, a whole sort of thing to be unpicked there and then actually today so because I knew I was going to film this as I was getting ready I put on now I thought I was actually putting on the same documentary I'd watched before just because I wanted to sort of reconnect with it a little bit before I was telling you guys like I watched it what I ended up putting on today was minimalism a documentary about the important things people who have families who are talking about how they try and maintain a sort of minimalist approach to life when they are living with other people because obviously you can do you but you can't make your wife, your husband, your partner, your children do your minimalist lifestyle if it's not what they want to an extent. Obviously with children you've got a certain degree of control but you know it's, it's about balance. Balance is the word of the day. So I was having all these thoughts so I'd written those ones down about women's perceptions and the way that I think it you want to, we want to vilify women I think sometimes for being shallow you know Sally Hughes talks about this where men are never raped over the coals for how much they'll spend on like a football season ticket or a card or whatever like because that's just men being men but it's okay to make fun of women for how much they'll spend on skincare or on shoes or whatever it's okay to make women's frivolous purchases the butt of the joke but actually we've conditioned this society where women are judged on these things and then we want to pull them apart for you know for interacting with them it's so utterly effed up like it, like it's so frustrating but anyway yeah we've created this society where women know they are where women are judged and know they are being judged on their appearance then we want to call them shallow and pull all this stuff apart and I was thinking about all of this and then I put on that documentary as I was getting ready which turned out to not be the one I thought I was putting on but then I've not finished it yet actually but a man who has written I think it's called Clutter Free with Kids I can't remember his name came on and he was talking about he's a minimalist and he has a son and a daughter and he says his son who is whatever age you know they were like, let's look through and get rid of some of your toys that you don't use anymore. And his son was like, yeah, okay. And he was like, oh, my daughter's totally different. She's seven, um, you know, but she just loves everything. She loves all her dolls. Like, she collects twigs, she collects stones. And he, they didn't really go into anything after that. They just kind of moved on and were talking about, you know, balancing 
kids with stuff. So, and then I was like, wait, there's something else in this then, because this seven year old girl, it's not clothes and shoes and makeup that she is holding on to, it's dolls and twigs and stones. And I don't know if that is then actually to do with, and I think, again, I think the marketing around children's things are, is so much better now than it was like when I was young, you know, in terms of the gender kind of side of it. I, I think we are making an effort as society to not gender toys quite so much and to make it more acceptable for like boys to play with dolls and to want to play house and whatever and girls can play sports and can play whatever G.I. Joes I think were mentioned in, in the documentary um, as one of the toys the little boy had. You know, I think especially in the internet we can maybe get into this bubble of because I feel like a lot of the people that I follow online it, it becomes this echo chamber of people who have fairly progressive politics that are you know sort of gender inclusive and like I know probably even in talking about what I'm talking about at the moment I'll have fallen through on certain things but like I'll edit them back and then be like oh I should have phrased this this way and I'll learn from it and I'm interested in learning from it and in being progressive and like you know if I had a child at the moment which is definitely not happening um you know but I know if I had a child I would want to bring them up in a way that was like celebratory of their instincts and who they are and what they wanted to play with they would get to play with and I wouldn't be like oh you can't play with this because you're a boy and a girl or whatever like I know that and I know that a lot of the people that I interact with online would also be like that but in the wider world these things are still not necessarily in practice up and down the country or we wouldn't still be having the fights that we're having so the point is even though I think the marketing might have changed for the better whether the practice has changed or not is totally up for debate and is it something to do and it, I really want to make sure I'm saying this is my thought process that I'm putting out into the universe it is not researched I've literally had it off the back of this documentary I was watching 10 minutes before I started filming but is it something inherently to do with female children being given dolls that they love and take care of and male children being pushed towards sports or playing at battles where they're blowing up their GI Joes whereas girls are maybe more like putting different outfits on their Barbies and doing a catwalk and whatever you know without making it about clothing or whatever are we encouraging female children to nurture and to look after things and to see things precious isn't really the word but that sort of you know their things are to be their signifiers of things that we would love like if you would love and take care of a human child you know a young girl with a doll is loving and taking care of her doll and playing like it is a human child and then that is that emotion crossing over into the doll into the stuff whereas for boys they're not putting emotion into a football that they're kicking around so and I again I'm really I'm so aware that I'm speaking in these sort of very stereotypically gendered roles here but is there something in why the seven-year-old girl well there is there has to be something right and I, I can't be making I'm not pulling this out of thin air there has to be some correlation between the fact that a seven-year-old girl loves every toy that she's got and you know it doesn't want to be parted with it and collects things and wants things. The battery on my main camera just ran out so I have switched to my vlogging camera so sorry if there is a jump in framing or whatever but I wanted to keep talking whilst I was sort of in the train of thought rather than waiting for the battery to recharge but I've lost exactly where it was in my train of thought but there has to be some correlation between why a seven-year-old girl is attributing love and possessiveness and unwillingness to part with her objects in comparison to a boy more easily parting with his objects that feeds into 
the fact that there's more men more able in this sort of minimalist lifestyle to part with their stuff and even as a general rule like none of the men that I know in real life would describe themselves as minimalists at all I'm sure half of them wouldn't have even heard of the concept but men generally get by with less stuff whereas women tend to be the ones that have more stuff I mean in the most like heteronormative marriages it tends to be that like you know what like what's that awful saying um uh, um a successful man is one who makes more than his wife can spend and a successful woman is one who finds such a man like it's it, you know it's it's awful and it's horrible but these stereotypes exist for a reason and there is a reason around women like buying stuff and and that's the thing I think that's like as much as like as I was saying Sally Hughes like references the amount of money men will spend on like football or cars like that women would spend on shoes and makeup men's things that they spend money on are quite often less things than women's things are does that make sense like like it's more like men will spend ridiculous amounts of money on sports and going to sports but it's more of an experience whereas women are buying physical shoes or men are buying like ridiculous cars but ultimately they're still functional cars and that you know and maybe they buy one or maybe two but that's not vilified in the same way that women having a lot of handbags is but there must be something in that there must I don't know what it is and that's but there has to be there is no way that these things do not correlate they do correlate I don't know how but I feel like that is a discussion and a piece of research that somebody needs to undertake if they have not done so already but I have only just thought about it so I am telling you this and it's very much hot take straight off the press no research but that is that is what's going through my head right now on gender roles within minimalism that whole thought process aside what I bought in March so I got the t-shirt which was where the whole t-shirt and jeans rant came from and returned it and I wasn't sure what I was going to get instead and and, I, and then I kind of thought I'm just going to have a no buy um, you know exactly as I've been thinking about in February you know let's roll an item over let's build it over but I ended up buying something and again it was quite strange in that it was kind of whimmy but kind of not so Native Porter had a 15% off event and I do love this I have to say I'm really I'm so pleased with this the vampire's wife day dress in the black was in stock on the website and it had 15% off of it so I got this it was still ridiculously expensive nowhere near as much as the Falconetti um so I think the normal price is 725 and I paid like 616 or something it was like it was a lot of money it was basically 100 pounds that I saved it was a really really good saving to get I absolutely love it it's really so I get two very conflicting because you know conflicting thoughts are what these videos are all about I've got two very conflicting thought processes off the back of this number one I love this dress so much it definitely like has absolutely like cemented it in my mind that the Falconetti is the dress I want for my birthday this year Um, not for my birthday for somebody to buy me but the dress I want to buy to wear on my birthday this year it just feels so special when I put this on I love it so so much it is definitely my favorite like clothing item that I own at the moment in a way it's sort of you know what I was saying about that top level item being like the best version of something and just buying it and buying it once and that's it you own the right version of it this feels like the right version of a black dress it's so beautiful I love it so much I am so pleased that I own it however I'm gonna put the dress away because I don't don't want to to say this around the dress and hurt its feelings whilst I love the dress and I do it's so it makes me so happy it started me thinking about the concept of investing in clothes buy better to buy once 
And I do absolutely 100% agree with that. But the flip side to that is that, again, it comes back to that. There's the top level, there's the imitation, which if we're talking about clothing, is like, you know, the designer version and the fast fashion version. And then there's a version that you can afford, which is somewhere in the middle. You know, if what you can afford is somewhere in the middle, obviously. There are people who can only afford to shop at, you know, Primark and the like, and that is fine. You have to shop where you can afford to shop. And of course, there are people who can afford to buy the top high-end designer items, you know, the way that the rest of us would buy things from ASOS. Like, you know, you do you. But for me, and I think for most people, there's somewhere in the middle. And that is really where you're comfortable being able to spend in a controlled way. I love this black dress, but ultimately I can't afford to buy, like part of the reason I love it so much is because it feels special. It does absolutely feel special to put on, but I can wear it with trainers. Like I can wear this dress casually. I feel like I will get a lot of wear out of this dress. However, if you invest in clothing, you're going to wear it out. Do you know what I mean? Like at some point, regardless of how good the quality is, you're going to wear it out. Because at the end of the day, it's only material. And no matter how good quality the material is, you're going to wear a hole in it. And yes, you can you can mend things and whatever, but like all clothing has a lifespan. And the lifespan can definitely be longer or shorter. And we want things with longer lifespans that we wear multiple times and don't overconsume and don't to harm the environment. We want those longer lifespans but ultimately no matter how long the lifespan is it's still a lifespan and I can't afford because this is the other thing is that if you are somebody who has a lot less stuff and you're wearing your stuff more frequently you will wear things out more quickly than if you're somebody who is in the current position that I am where I have so much stuff that I could probably dress myself for a year quite easily. It is awful as that sounds. Like if I was to take into consideration not just the stuff I have in my bedroom which would probably do me for quite a while but also the amount of stuff I have in the loft I could probably wear a different outfit every single day for a year and probably not repeat like probably wear my jeans more than once or whatever but I could probably do it so that I never wore a top or a dress more than once. And the scary thing is I don't I have too much stuff. Yes I want less stuff. I am not a hoarder, like I don't have so much stuff that other people would see as problematic. I'm finding it stressful and I'm finding it problematic but like ultimately you can still walk through my house, it's absolutely fine, you know. If you came into my bedroom and I wasn't expecting you, I'm not saying it wouldn't be a bit messy but it can get tidied and if I'm expecting you, you probably would think things are in good order around here. Like I know I have too much stuff but I don't look like I have too much stuff. I am not some one of these people that has like rooms in their house that you can't go into because they've hoarded stuff that ends up on TV. Like I'm not at that end of the scale. But I still have too much stuff. But it doesn't look it looks like a normal version of stuff. Does that make sense? Like we have normalized having too much stuff. That is the thing. So yes, I could in theory wear everything in my wardrobe once in a year. That's probably quite easy. So yes, it would take me ages and ages and ages to wear something out at the current level of stuff that I have. But if I reduce the volume of stuff and I have a wardrobe, say Project 333 for example, which I'm considering going down that route for somewhere, we'll see. Like, you then start wearing your stuff more so you wear it out more quickly, which the more you reduce your stuff and move towards this minimalist lifestyle, then in a way the more often you have to start replacing stuff. And I can't afford to be replacing £700 dresses once a month or so. I don't know, I don't know how often you'd be talking about replacing stuff, but like right now the only stuff I'd really put through as replacements in terms of me looking at replacements coming out of my budget is underwear and sportswear, gym wear, because I have two gym outfits and you know, you're sweating into them, you're working out in them, 
they are going to need replaced and my skinny jeans is kind of a grey area in that I would replace them because I wear holes in the thighs but I also wear holes in the thighs because I wear them way way more than I wear other things and I haven't actually replaced my blue skinny jeans and um, it's making there are things in my wardrobe that I'm not getting wear out of that I've noticed because I don't have blue skinny jeans to wear them with but it's making me wear other things more by not having them so they're not like a replacement that I need to make my life function but they are an item that I would wear out and replace as such and I would say my lifespan on skinny jeans is like depending on what jeans I buy somewhere between okay maybe three months is pushing it but maybe like six months to replace a pair of jeans you know sportswear and underwear I'm not replacing dresses on the reg at the moment like you know I don't know what that would be if I got my wardrobe so far down that I was wearing things out and replacing them I don't know how often we'd be talking about replacing them but I am not in a financial position where I want to replace a £700 dress with another £700 dress every three months or something do you know what I mean? I need to find a way of investing enough into my clothing that I am getting a good quality product and we all know that price is not an indication of quality half the time so I feel like I need to do like more research into understanding like materials but even that's the whole like it's not just the base material can be 100% cotton and it can be badly sourced cotton and it can be really thin or it can be 100% cotton that's really thick and durable like there's this whole sort of education that I think I need to get to be able to do this where I would be able to invest in my clothing enough that I knew I was buying something that had a long lifespan but I'm not investing financially into clothing that I can't afford to replace on the regular either. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. But yes, I think finally those are all my February and March thoughts and feelings. I'm not going to go through my wish lists and whatever. Basically everything that was on it in January is still on my wish list despite the fact that neither of the items I bought in February or March were wish list I, I definitely I can't remember if I mentioned the Vampire's Wife day dress in my January video or not. I know I talked about the Falconetti but yeah the day dress has been on my radar for quite a while but I don't know if I ever made it an official wish list item or not so it was kind of on my wish list but maybe not on my official wish list. But yeah pretty much everything that was on it still on it other than the self portrait dress and the Dior belt that I talked about coming off the wish list. Nothing else has kind of dropped off of it like I had a brief look through before I started filming I still kind of want everything. In terms of what has been added to my wish list since then River Island dress it's super cute it looks like vintagey. I'm going to go to Cahoots when I go to London I feel like it'd be the perfect thing to wear there and it's just very sweet and I feel like it's very me so I want that and the Colourpop Limoncello palette I just think is lovely and then also the Colourpop Wild Child collection I really like a lot of the eyeshadows and the eyeshadow palette which only came about because I was looking at the Limoncello collection and then I was on the website and then I looked because I don't really follow Colourpop all that much because like to buy things from Colourpop in the UK you need to spend $60 pre-tax to get free international shipping and obviously Colourpop is very affordable in the scheme of things so you get a lot for your $60 and I don't want a lot of stuff so those things are on my wish list but yeah I would, even getting the Colourpop and the Limoncello things wouldn't bring me to the minimum shipping for Colourpop so it's just not really worthwhile paying the ship it off. It's a whole thing. They're on my wish list and that's where I'm going to leave it. So thank you very much if you've got to this point in the video. I don't know how long this, I feel like I've filmed for hours. Like I should have taken note of the time when I started filming. I'm not looking forward to editing this one but I hope that you have enjoyed watching it. I hope it's been interesting. Let me know what your thoughts are on the gender politics of minimalism. Like, am I making a mountain out of a molehill here? I feel like I can't be. I feel like there has to be something in that. And yeah, thank you very much for watching. I'm going to stop talking now and I'll speak to you in my next video.